is good to remind you all that uh, Christ himself has the right and by his authority to call this day his own, and so it is first and foremost his day. Uh, nevertheless, I feel grateful that at uh, an earlier time he formed a government that was aware that it was not the ultimate authority, that it was under God, and that therefore, since God had given certain rights, those rights are inalienable. So we can rejoice over that, and we can continue to pray to God that we would be provided those inalienable rights that we might lead godly lives that are not in constant conflict. So that's why I'd like to open this morning, as I would just like to pray in light of the Lord's day and his reign, but also in light of our country's history. So please join me as we pray in opening our service. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you reign over all nations, you look down and all nations and their leaders across all time look like grasshoppers in the grass. Lord, it is a declaration of your sovereignty to allow others to have a kind of power to rise and to fall. You have seen many leaders and many nations throughout the time on the face of this earth. Lord, we know that at a certain time, uh, it seems in the history of every nation, the leader ends up becoming too big for their britches and forgetting the authority which they are under. Lord, we recognize that this too is a part of the founding of this United States. We understand, Lord, that it is not pure and holy, it is not perfect, that it is a form of government, and that you work through other forms of government, but we do recognize, Lord, that it was your grace alone that gave men and women the wisdom to know that they were under God, and to form what they did form in light of that, insofar as you permitted them. Lord, we know that heaven and earth must unite. We know, Lord, that that will take place when you return. And we look forward to the day. We ask, Lord, that in the meantime, that whichever direction this country or the many under other countries over which you reign, whatever direction they go, that you would give us wisdom that you would maintain a certain cap on sin, that it cannot get as bad as it could, that you would curb the lusts and, des and desires that can grow within the human heart. We pray that you would let us live peaceful and godly lives. We do pray, Lord, for the sake of this United States of America, that you would not remove all wisdom. Lord, the boundaries and the limitations and the rules that you have established for your cosmos are being pushed at every level, like sea waves breaking against a seawall and tearing out the bulwark, ready to drown the city is our society. We pray, Lord, that you would restrain them for their own good. We pray, Lord, that you would not bring that level of judgment until the end. And that once you do, that your glory would resound throughout the earth, that all nations would be united under you in its manifest qualities as the kingdom of God. We pray, Lord, until that day, that you would give us your heavenly colony here on earth, that you would give us lives to live that are heavenly. We ask, Lord, that we would be committed to each other, and that we would look out for the common good of all, even in this country. We ask, Lord, that your name would be glorified in all of these things, and we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for the call to worship. We are moving a little slow today. I just returned from one week of debate. What is your excuse? <laughs> All right, we need, <laughs> we, need to, we need to get warmed up here. This call to worship we choose is typically in the imperative. It means it is, it is a command based on the authority of God. He's calling you to gather and to worship him on his day, and he wants a resounding joy 
It's called rejoicing. And so hear this, and then let us sing, uh, despite how we may feel, let us sing our first hymn. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations and the imperative, praise the Lord. And so let us do so together by singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let us hear God's word from 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 15. I speak not my, by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you are burdened, of course, Paul is speaking about a collection here for the poor. But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality, as it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the vision that is given here based on who Christ is and also how he acted as the eternal Son of God amongst those in the wilderness. Lord, we thank you for this revelation that you have given to us that we may know how to conduct ourselves before you. Lord, it is always a gift to know who you are and what you require of us. Here, Lord, we see that we are to give and to relieve each other of need in concrete, practical ways. Lord, I am sure over this past week there have been needs that have come before us and we have only wished people well. We ask that you would lead us into repentance because you love a cheerful giver. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated.
Good morning, Seven Run. It is a joy to be here to worship the living God with you all. I want to give you a hypothetical and uh, wonder how you would feel about this situation. You're away from your home for, say, about a week, and when you get home, there's something gone terribly wrong. A plumbing issue. Pipes burst. All that nastiness all over the place. You see an advertisement for Paul the plumber. He says, expert master plumber can fix any problem. You say, okay. Pick up the phone. You give him a call. Hello, this is Paul. Paul, I need a master expert plumber to come to my house to fix this awful problem. Well, I'm so sorry, but that's not what I do. I'm, I'm sorry, Paul, your advertisement says you're an expert plumber. You can fix anything. I, I, I'm well trained. I know everything there is to know about plumbing, that's for sure. I, I just don't do house calls. Would you consider that man an actual plumber? At best, he's a potential instructor or a trainer, but he's certainly not a plumber. Well, brothers and sisters, let's apply this to us as Christians. There's a passage in James chapter 2 I want to draw your attention to very quickly. You don't need to turn there. I will read it for us. James chapter 2, it's in verses 14. If this little tiny Bible I have could just flip pages. Verses 14 through 17, and you may be very familiar with it already. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. Now we have to be careful with a passage like that. We are not saying that you earn salvation through your works, but we must recognize that we show that we are saved objectively by the Lord God through the fruit of our lives, which is good works. The plumber who's trained in an expert shows the fruit of his training and expertise by doing the good work of the plumbering. And we need to take this to heart. Because as Pastor Jesse just said, there may have been some who have come to us seeking what they need most desperately. It probably wasn't plumbing work. It might have been to move a rancid refrigerator. Hallelujah, praise the Lord for Severn Run. But most likely they have come to you expressing the despair that Pastor Jesse prayed against, the despair that the world and the government and the people who hate God are trying to push on all of us. And if they come to you, and they have come to you, I'm sure, showing that despair, and you have let them walk away saying, well, chin up, keep calm, it'll all get better from here, but you did not tell them how. And you did not inform them that what they need to do is allow all that despair and terribleness that they're witnessing to push them toward Christ. If you have not done that, then you said, go be warm, be well filled. This is not an academic faith. We don't just believe things up here. We do things with our life. We live our life for Jesus Christ And we must be on the lookout for those who do not know him when they come to Christians that we don't just send them off as the world sends them with a a happy slogan or maybe a, you know, something to help them for a week. We need to be Christians. And when they come to us and say, I'm in despair, let's take our expertise, let's take our training, and let's do the house call. And let's put ourselves to work. Brothers and sisters, this is why The Lord gave us the Great Commission. We are to go and to make disciples of every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is why there is a creation mandate. We are to do what? Fill the world. We are to multiply. We are to subdue it. This is the work of the church. This is what God sends us to. As we pray in this time of our service, as our confession of sin, I will pray for us. 
And then I will leave time for you to pray in the silence of your own hearts with God. And then we will lift our eyes together and receive from his holy word the assurance that we have been pardoned. Let us pray. Holy Father, how good it is to call upon your name, your holy, awesome name, your name that has been present in all creation since before the beginning. We know that you dwell outside of time and space, and so none of what we experience here can directly relate to you, and so we are so grateful that your spirit in mercy is sent to us to give us understanding to let us see as you see through your mercy. Lord, you did this for us while we were still sinners, while we were enemies to you, while we fought against your perfect plan of redemption, you entered into our life and you gave us a brand new heart and we had Nothing to do with that except to receive it. The only part that we played in being justified was the sin we had committed that needed reconciliation to you. And so we recognize that every person we encounter in this world is in the exact same position we found ourselves in, needing you to transform them and bring them to true life. Father, we as your living children, heirs to your kingdom, waiting patiently and gratefully for the return of our big brother, the king of the whole universe, we wait for him. And as we do this, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for the many opportunities we have let slide by, that you will open our eyes to all the future opportunities of those who are needing your grace, That when they come to us, we would be able to put our gloves on, to cinch our tool belt and get to work, showing them where they have fallen short and where the only solution lies. We pray, Lord, that you would have us be doers of your word and not simply hearers, and that you would encourage us, Lord, by bringing many of the unfaithful to merciful, gracious, joyful worship, that they would recognize their state, turn, and become part of this amazing body, your bride. Lord, we, we walk around in our lives not looking for these opportunities. We look for ways that we can be comfortable, ways that we can not be hassled, ways that we can get 15% off on appliances, but we do not go around in our lives constantly looking to and fro for the person who needs the love of Christ to be showered upon them, or the person who needs the resources you have given to us that they might have bread and water, or the person who is in such despair because of the events of their lives that they need someone to come and simply hold them no matter how wretched they are. Lord, may we, may we stop this nonsense of forgetting the muck and the mire from which you pulled us. And may we constantly be looking for those who need the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ as exercised through the church. And now, Father, I pray that you will hear the innermost voice in the secret place of our hearts this morning, that you would hear the prayers of your people. Father, your word tells us 
that the prayer of the righteous availeth much. And we know that the only reason we can claim any sort of righteousness is because of the mercy of Christ and his righteousness you have put upon us. It is for this reason that we have great confidence and joyful confidence, knowing that for his sake you have heard our prayers and you are pleased to answer them because of your great love for him and us. We have prayed this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now lift your eyes, people of God. His word in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 through 21 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In Christ, there is reconciliation to the Father. That is why we are sure of our pardon. Brothers and sisters, may we stand, and as it says in Ephesians 5, we will sing unto one another hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs. Let us sing together, so send I you, and remind one another of what it is Christ has done in the mission we are on.
people say amen. amen. Please remain standing as our uh, deacon, elder, fill-in, stand-in guy comes and brings the offering for God's blessing. appropriate for us to say amen because we know that you have done it it is true it is faithful we do praise you for all blessings come only from you you have blessed this church Severn run with these people and through these people you will bless many more through the gifts that have been offered here this morning we pray Lord that you will give us clean consciences and clear hearts and minds that we would know why we give and we would know to whom we give and we would know the great joy that is being brought into this county through the gifts that you have made us capable of giving. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to provide for each of us individually and for this church together and for the PCA Lord, continue to give all that is necessary and required that we may take your good news, your gospel, to every corner of this county, of this country, and of this earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's holy word. The children um, three years and younger are now dismissed to the nursery. Let's turn to Acts chapter 11, and our reading today will be verses 27 through 30. <clears throat> Eleven twenty-seven through 30. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Let us pray. Christ, as our King, we ask that you would let us know your will, and we pray that you would execute your will by way of us, your bride. We ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom to be in the world, but not of it. In Christ's name, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Last week, we had the opportunity to observe from God's holy word, Jesus pouring out his kingly grace upon Gentiles in Antioch. Jerusalem sent Barnabas, Barnabas grabbed Paul, 
And both Barnabas and Paul taught the Gentiles for a whole year. And one of the main questions we ended up asking was, well, what did they teach? And of course, we looked to Acts 26 to see that they taught good works in keeping with their repentance. But when we got into the particulars, what we saw, because of the language of the hand of the Lord being political, is that they were teaching, generally speaking, that they are called to allegiance to King Jesus. Their life in the community was meant, just as our life today is meant in our day and time, to be a public display of loyalty to the king. This week, what we can do is we can still ask that question, what did they teach? What did it look like for them to disciple them? And we can actually be a bit more specific about what loyalty looks like. To get at that loyalty and what it looks like, I have three observations for you this morning before we get into some of the implications. The three observations are about disciples, about the relief, and about a pattern that we're seeing here. So just uh, follow these, these words with me. I want you to first notice that when we get to verse 27, when we read about these folks in Antioch in verse 29, it refers to them as disciples. Now that lets you know what's Luke, what Luke's emphasis is. What is he focusing on? What a person is called uh, helps you to know how another person who's calling them that is viewing them. I'm sure you've been called lots of things. And what a person calls you lets you know what they, how they're focused on you. And here they are called disciples. He doesn't call them Gentiles. He calls them disciples because the focus at this point is how this new community is following publicly Christ Jesus as the king. So that's the first observation I want you to, I don't want you to miss that. And there's another observation with another word, and it's the word relief. It is a very important word, which is why that's the title of the sermon. You can see that also here, that they gave relief. The way they follow Christ as king is summarized in this word. It's actually a bit of a technical term. We know that this word, if you were to look at the original language, it's the same word we have for deacon. And you can see why that word would be present here. Agabus, a prophet, revealed that there would be a worldwide famine. The disciples in Antioch, therefore, decided to send relief, or if you wanted to, you could say, in the spirit of a deacon, they decided to serve. They decided to serve the brethren who are dwelling in Judea. But you need to think of diaconal relief and diaconal service. That's what they're entering into. They have become the servants of those who are in Judea, which is interesting because it's a primarily Jewish population. So you're really seeing the household of God coming together here. It was a small beginning with Cornelius, and now you see even the sharing of finances. Like deacons, they heard of the practical and the concrete needs of the brethren in verse 29, and in Christ, therefore, they pulled together what they had, and they sent it by the hands of Barnabas and Paul to those who are in need. Now, that's the second observation. So we have a key word, disciples. We have a key word, relief to help us to know what's going on here. But then there's also a pattern which really shapes our understanding of all of the, the particulars. I wonder if you notice the pattern. This is a regular pattern that we have seen within the book of Acts. Christ, as the king, is moving from town to town conquering. He sends a spirit, and to those who receive the spirit, a particular set of actions and way of thinking and attitude start to spring forth from them as the fruits of the spirit. We have seen this picture before, in other words, which is why the title of this observation is Pattern. Think of Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as anyone had need. You already saw this within the Jewish community that was filled with the Spirit. 
It happens again in Acts chapter 4, verses 33 through 35. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as any one had need. It ends up being a mark of what it means to be a Christian community, to see needs amongst the brethren and to meet the need. It ends up being the primary way in which the church is witnessed on the face of the earth. They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. You see that? That's really what's going on here. That's Luke's emphasis. What we are witnessing here is not just good-hearted human compassion and philanthropy. We witness the heart of what it means to be a spirit-filled community of loyal disciples for Christ. This was flowing out of the teaching that Barnabas and Paul were giving to them. Much of that teaching is retained for us in 2 Corinthians. But here we see that through this community's actions, they are manifesting the doctrine that Paul and Barnabas gave to them. And that is basically this. You have been called by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples. And as the disciples of Jesus Christ, you must be like Christ. And to be like Christ means that you serve the church community because that is what he does through and through. If you wanted to put it a bit shorter, this is really the main reality that Luke is emphasizing, that as disciples of Christ, we are like Christ, serving or giving relief to the church community. Now, there are two ways to fall off the path here. If you were to think of a, a single path, and that's the correct teaching and living here, you can fall off on the right-hand side of the cliff that's on the path, or the left-hand side of the cliff. You can either be too narrow or you can be too broad. And guess what? Those are the main implications this morning. So that's how I want to draw that out, that as disciples of Christ, we are like Christ serving the church community. And I want to look at becoming too narrow, or avoiding becoming too narrow, and understanding that, and then avoiding being too broad. Too narrow. We must not understand this passage too narrowly. The concrete situation is a famine. Paul and Barnabas took concretely a financial collection. You can read about this actually in many letters of the scriptures. And they took that from the concrete disciples in Antioch down to Judea, which was about 350 miles away. They brought concrete money to them, distributing it to the poor for bread and other food and perhaps medical needs. But you are in too narrow of a state of mind if you think that is the only application for relieving need in the church community. If you think that serving the church community, for example, is only financial or only relates to the poor or only involves food and famine, then your vision has become too narrow. We are given scriptures like this not to lose ourselves in the particularity, but to be able to see a larger vision when held together with the rest of the counsel of God. The main point ends up being that as disciples of Christ, we are like Christ in serving the church community. And so what you end up having to ask is what does Christ look like in his service to his bride? Is it only financial care? Is it only food care? Is it only medical care? Of course, it's not, it's not less than that. But what is, his, what is Christ's overarching attitude? What is his posture toward his community who is the church? Well, in actually the development of Paul's theology of giving, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 at least, in verse 9, listen to, in our bulletin, you, we have already read this, listen to this main statement to orient you so that you don't become too narrow in your understanding. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now you see that that's not just located in one small part of human life. He just consumed everything. Rich and poor here are not limited to financial assets. This is portraying Jesus in light of a deep biblical framework for a righteous king. And you can see that from key words that are happening in 2 Corinthians. Listen to this from Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3. This should be very familiar with you. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now, anyone who has taken the time to study the Psalms understands that this is primarily speaking about the king. It is the, this whole first section of the Psalms is moving into the king and his reign and the authority that will be given to him by God. There's a, there are coronation psalms. And here we know that the king is dedicated to meditating on the law day and night. It's one of their jobs. That's why they get a copy of the law. And then you can see that a role of a righteous king is as they are planted by these rivers of water, as they are filled with the Spirit, to not only understand, but to execute that law, to actually have some kind of power, they bring forth fruit in its season. Their leaf doesn't wither. Nothing can stand against them. They prosper. Now, as Americans, we typically read this psalm as, well, if I obey God, then I will get personal success. And that's not what's going on here. This is all about community. It is an unrighteous king if you wanted to retain that, even in your individualistic reading, if it's an individual or an individual king and they're only working for their own good so that they can have greater houses, it's an unrighteous king by definition. He becomes like a tree, Jesus Christ, of course, being the king. He becomes like a tree from whom the whole community benefits. His good works become like fruit feeding the whole community, especially those who have trouble getting the fruit. He makes sure that they get something. That's what's going on in all of these accounts across Act. Is you're seeing a righteous king act through his people, setting up a society that is just. And the point is that since we are his disciples, that we are to imitate the righteous king. It is the fundamental posture, and it must be the fundamental posture of Christians to be righteous in their relationship with the church community in the same way that the king is righteous in relationship to his community. So let me ask you a few questions just so we can start to get down into the particularities of your life. There are two answers to every one of these questions. There is an answer from the world, and there is an answer from Christ. As disciples of Christ, what is the purpose of you getting a career and having a career and being established in your career? Think of the American answer to that. What's the American answer to that? Toys? Personal peace and affluence? What is Christ's answer? The community. Let me get, you know, if you, I'm, each question meddles just a little bit more. Here's another one. As disciples of Christ, what is the purpose of marriage? It is only a modern conception of marriage to think that it is for you primarily as an individual. It has historically been known as a benefit to the community. That's because, historically, people were listening to Christ. As disciples of Christ, what is the purpose of having or adopting children? It's the same answer. As disciples of Christ, what is the purpose of education? I gave you the example last week of a, a village sending off someone from Uganda into American University to come back and benefit the community. That's Christ's vision. As disciples of Christ, what is the purpose of singleness? 
when you look at singleness, which can happen multiple ways and is given multiple names in the scriptures, the purpose ends up being for dedication in a way that those who are married cannot give to the community. For example, if you are single by way of being widowed, if you look at the scriptures, you have the time to dedicate to the saints in person and in prayer that no one who is married would be able to do. It is a gift. The world tells us that those things are for status, that those things are for your prestige, that those things are for your personal peace and your affluence. And what we are seeing here, if we do not become too narrow, is that Christ tells us that those things are all meant for Christian community. That is exactly what the king has done. He did not just keep his glory to himself, grasping for it, unwilling to let it go. Look at Philippians chapter 2. If you become rich in any of those areas, you are called to become like Christ using what you have for the brethren, even if they are 350 miles away or more. That's the model for us here. And it's another piece of the puzzle on what it would mean to live under Christ as his disciple. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And essentially what we're being taught here is that deep Deuteronomic, proverbial, and psalmic vision of life. That we may be like trees whose fruit feeds. Not just in finances, that would be too narrow. This ends up being a whole life perspective which is completely subversive to everything you're taught from the world. At least these days. Now that's what it would mean, at least in one sense, to become too narrow, to miss this whole vision that's happening here. But we could also become too broad. The opposite problem is too broad. The disciples in Antioch give relief to the brethren. They do not open up relief, in this case, to the whole world. I'm not saying that it's wrong to give relief to those who are not the brethren, but there is a priority to the household of God. So we must not become too broad. And there's a great deal of wisdom that needs to be exercised in conducting yourself in these areas. Because of Christ's work in uniting Jew and Gentile by the Spirit, they have become one household. And it's not a theoretical union. It's playing out in real life and how they relate to each other. And those in the same household give priority to others in the household. And this is largely misunderstood today, and we will find ourselves as a church in a great deal of trouble if we don't start making some of these distinctions. Giving relief as Christians is often framed as general compassion for whoever. There's no sense of priorities, there's no hierarchy, and you will land yourself in trouble. And of course, Christians should do good to all, but our priority is to the Christian community as brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers in Christ. And I say this because primarily of multiple scriptures, but the most explicit one is Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. There's a delicate balance there and hierarchy and distinctions. Now, to bring this point home, I want to, you to consider the original situation that this group of people are facing. It'll help you to understand why this distinction needs to be made, and I am anticipating you're going to need to start making this distinction more and more. Jerusalem and Judea received the grace of Christ, and they swore allegiance to King Jesus. This resulted, as we have just read again last week, in a widespread persecution where they had to flee their hometowns. 
If you were a follower of Jesus Christ, that was not a commendable statement. You were removed from your local church, your lifeline to your community of any kind of help. You were disowned by your family. If you look at the, the letter to the Hebrews, your property was confiscated. There were no houses and homes for you any longer. You did not have brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. You were removed from the family. Your family ties and the, the people that you would rely upon when you got in trouble, all of that was severed. And in a community like that, in that ancient world, that meant death. So what do they do? Let me just ask you, what do they do in a situation like that? When you have no family and you have no church, to whom can you turn? And of course, we know that Jesus thought of this. And he established another family upon which all Christians could rely, even if their biological families denied them. And you will see, just knowing that fact, that Christ was aware that this was happening and he would set it up for people to be okay, you can start looking through the scriptures, like Luke chapter 18, 19 through 30. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. And that is what happened. The Christian community, whether Jew or Gentile, became each other's brother and sister. They shared house and they shared home because they were now the household of God. I saw this taken very seriously by one pastor who I was under for some time. Or I shouldn't say I saw, I heard of this report. I heard a report where the pastor was seeking to take care of one of the congregants. They were, in a ver they were in a medical emergency, goes to the hospital to be with the congregant, and of course, the world does not think like Christ thinks. And so they said, you can't come in here unless you're family. And the report, and there's no, uh, to my knowledge, there was no one there for this person. And taking them at their word, but more importantly, taking God at his word, the pastor said, well, well, I'm her brother. He was living it out. And that ends up showing a mentality that is meant to, to, to be a part of us as a body. You can see why that would be so important in that original context, can't you? If they didn't take up the mantle of being each other's brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, they would be destitute. And it is already beginning amongst us today where the same thing is happening. I already have experience with folks who have had to give up their mothers and their fathers in order to follow Christ. And I can't tell you who those people are because I'm not going to embarrass them but they are depending upon you to be their family. This is not a quaint idea. This is the plan of Jesus Christ himself because he knows what his community will face as they wait for him in long suffering. Through the time of the virus, Christ has in fact, I'm watching him do it in his providence, Christ has, in fact, and is, in fact, separating his church from the world. There's a great sifting going on right now. The church was wrapped up in personal police and affluence, as I have declared to you before. That was our main goal in life. The church has been involved in a large-scale idolatry. And Christ is changing that in his mercy and in his grace. As Christians are in the world, but not truly of it, as the shift starts to happen, where he calls his people out from the idolatry, it will become more and more clear that there are two separate cities in the world. 
And this city over here, though, was capable in the past of relying on this city, it will not be able to happen like that anymore. And that will mean the separation of brother and sister, of grandchild and grandparent. And some of you are already beginning to experience this. So it is now time to understand that we cannot become too broad. That we have a responsibility and a priority to each other that Christ declares in his word for a reason. I think the main question here that you need to consider as a Christian, because this is how it happens practically and concretely, when the Christian community, when someone needs you, who is your Christian brother and sister or child or mother or father, when they need you, will you be available? That's the main question. And the answer in the past, because of the large-scale idolatry, is you were not available. I'm speaking generally. Because you were wrapped up in some other priority. And here, we have a call back to this vision. We must not give ourselves away to other communities as a priority, but to God and his people. We are called to not be too broad, in other words, in our communal allegiances. There are many communities out there that want all of your attention. But we are to do good especially to the household of faith. If I am seeing things correctly, then a good model to leave you with, a little vision to leave you with where we are heading are families who are not native to the United States of America. We have one here, they gather here for Korean church, and they have such a strong culture where they are relying on one another that no matter where their children go to school, they always end up the best in the school. And the only way that they can do that is because even in the teenager's mind, their primary allegiance is to the Korean community. They know this. This is what I knew too growing up, that if I make that decision, my grandmother is going to whack my butt. And that was motivating. But my mind was on a particular community just as theirs is, and that, I believe, is where the Christian community is going. And I'm going to tell you right now that if you neglect the means of grace, of contributing to the community and letting it contribute to you, I do not believe that you will make it. As disciples of Christ, we are like Christ serving and giving relief to the church community. It is His divine means of grace so that we can make it, so that we can be preserved, so that we can persevere. We must not think of this too narrowly. We must be like trees bearing fruit in every area for the community, not just in finances. If you have a gift or a talent that is meant to be given away. We must not think too broadly the needs of the household of faith in wisdom receive priority. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us this vision on how you have set up your kingdom, taking into consideration the practical and concrete needs of your people, especially when things become more and more difficult within their particular societies. Lord, I think of those who have it far worse than us at this point, and how you are providing for them to reunite as households not bound by blood, but bound by spirit. I thank you that you have done this throughout the ages, giving relief to those who are in need. Lord, there is much relief that is needed these days among us, and I pray that you would pour out your spirit on us. Lord, I understand if you would not pour out your spirit before this time, because anything you would give us, we would use for selfish ambition. But Lord, it seems that you are changing us now, and that we want to use everything that you give us for the other. 
We pray, Lord, therefore, that you would pour your spirit out on us, that you would give us the responsibility for small things. And as we are faithful to you by way of your grace, we ask for larger and larger responsibilities that we may glorify your name. Lord, I pray for those growing up in the church. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to see your vision for the good life, that it is not fundamentally selfish, it is not fundamentally individual, it is not fundamentally about what you own. Lord, I pray that you would give them the desire to have a reputation which by definition involves their glory amongst a community for what they do for the community, the good works. I pray, Lord, in other words, for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, and that you would beat back the kingdom of Satan. I pray, Lord, as we relieve the needs of each other and we become strong, that we would look out for the common good. For you, Lord, give your reign to the righteous and the unrighteous. ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Let us... Stand and prepare for the supper by singing, What Wondrous Love Is This? It's hymn number three, and I'd ask for the elders to prepare the table.
This is not the table of seven run, but the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are not a Christian, then this table is not for you. In other words, you are not a member of his community. And here at this table is an example of his priority. His priority is to feed his people, to feed his sheep as he instructed Peter. And he does so in these remembrances by faith this morning. We actually have as a part of his teaching, our great king, that you are, as one who is not a part of the Christian community, he gives a warning and he says that for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick, and many die. He does this as a grace to protect you from his judgment at this time. But I think in hearing his authority in declaring his rule over this table is another grace. Because if you do not bow the knee and seek to be reconciled with the king, then whether you eat at this table or not, judgment will come upon you. So I encourage you that if you're not a Christian, that you would not partake of this meal that is for his people, and that if you are not a Christian, that you would run to Christ and that you would seek forgiveness, that you would kiss the Son before he becomes angry. For you, Christian, this table is a continuation of the preached word, but it is seen. Look at what your king has done for you, and look at what it means for you to be his disciple. I can't help but to think of Philippians chapter 2 and coming to the table after preaching from Acts that way, where Paul encourages Christians that they would have the same mind in them which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you see that through his sacrificial work as the righteous king that he gains a glorious reputation amongst his community? The same reputation is beckoning to you as being his disciple. That you would not be known as the person with the greatest car, but the one who had a less expensive car to contribute to the community. That's the true reputation of Christ. To give up that others may have. To live not for self, but for the other. And here we see the ultimate example. The example that has made all of the difference. Because I've got to tell you folks, if you have forgotten, you were poor and wretched in every way. And now because of Christ, you are the richest and the wealthiest people on the face of the earth. Let us pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the words seen here that we may remember who our Savior is. Lord, it is good to know who you are to be able to give you glory. Lord, we ask that you would receive praise from us. We are your community and we are aware in the depths of our heart what you have contributed to our lives, which is everything which is why we give thanks to you before every meal, acknowledging that you are the giver of all good gifts. 
And Lord, we give thanks to you before this meal also, which is the meal that for signifies what you have done, signifies what you have done, and for signifies what you shall bring to completion and finish. We know, Lord, that all things within your hand are used for the benefit of your church and her glory, that you might bring all things into one and present them to the Father. We ask, Lord, that we would live in appreciation of this. We ask even more that our appreciation would overflow and that we would become like you, that we would be a community that has a different set of standards for what it means to be great. We ask, Lord, that as we take this wine and this bread, that our love for you would grow. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Uh, Mark, you can dismiss the rose.
I ask that you would keep Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and following in your mind as you hear the words of the institution. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Know who your God is through the supper today and that you are being conformed into his image. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Family of God, let us take and eat. Lord, it is one thing to sacrifice yourself for a righteous person. And it is another thing to sacrifice yourself for people like us. But Lord, this sacrifice, it shows the greatness of your esteem. We truly discover in this supper with this broken bread, who you are as God and who you have called us to be as your children. It, Lord, in viewing the mercy, exposes even more the depth of our sin and all of the individual selfish choices that we have made, the ignorance that we all share as to what life is supposed to be about the inability to move past the selfish desire. But Lord, what it does is our sin magnifies your mercy all the more. Grace abounds because it shows us, Lord, the loving kindness that you have poured out on us, the work that you have obligated yourself to do where you have said that you will finish us as your master workmanship. We thank you, Lord, that we can remember all of these things. We pray that you would give us great assurance even when we know our sin because we are in the hands of the master craftsman and you have committed yourself to us. And we pray, Lord, that as you shape us in your image, that we would be willing to give up our very lives. In your name, amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us take and drink. Lord, we know that this wine represents your dedication to the covenant that you have established. Lord, it gives us great confidence to know that you are with us till the end. We pray, Lord, as our great King who has committed himself to us that we would not despise the grace that you have given to us that we might hold on. We pray, Lord, that we would not despise it by neglecting our duty to each other. We pray, Lord, that we would not despise it by forgetting to humble ourselves and to receive when we are in need. We pray, Lord, that instead we would submit to the grace that you offer to us that we might persevere. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Let us stand and close our service with our final hymn.
and now receive the Lord's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.